Good afternoon and welcome to this, our second in our 2021 webinar series uh, delivered to us, um, to you, by Dr. Tim Sandal. These monthly webinars will be covering different aspects of Annex 1 and hopefully they'll help you prepare when it goes live. Today's uh, webinar will cover quality risk management aspects of Annex 1. But before we get into it, um, I'd like to do a little bit of housekeeping. If you have any technical issues, if you can send a short message in the questions box on the right hand side of your screen, um, our team will try to respond and try to resolve your issue. Um, please be aware that we are working remotely, so sometimes there might be a slight delay um, and there's only so much we can help you with from our side of things. During the webinar, RSSL would like to invite you to ask as many questions as possible using the questions box again on the right hand side. And at the end of the webinar, time permitting, we'll try to answer as many of these questions as possible. Any we don't get round to today, we will answer offline and we'll share them with you all along with a copy of the slides from today and a link to view the webinar again if, in case you have any issues with your connections. So, for those of you who didn't attend our webinar series of last year or the first webinar um, of this year's series, my name's Annette Russell and I'm the Sterile Manufacturing Lead at RSSL. I work in the commercial team at RSSL, uh, working primarily with our pharmaceutical microbiology team to help support our clients both in sterile and non-sterile manufacture. If you're interested in any of the services that RSSL can offer um, to help support you, please go, do get in contact with me via the details on the webinar um, on the slide in front of you. Before I start the webinar properly, I thought um, I'd start with a little poll for you all. So um, as we are starting to see COVID restrictions lessen across the um, countries, I was wondering which of these you would most likely be doing as the first thing um, when the restrictions are lifted in your particular area. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to answer the poll and let's see how many people uh, are going to um, hug their family or go to the pub, are quite happy how it is, or are going to come and attend more RSSL webinars. So about three quarters have voted. Give you a couple more seconds. Excellent. So um, I'll share with you the, the results. So it looks like most popular thing, and it's not really a surprise, is that people want to go meet their family for hugs. And I really appreciate this, having a young grandson myself that I haven't been able to hug for a, a quite a long time. I, I see where you're coming from with that. 37% um, of, of you would like to go to the pub or restaurant with friends. And again, another great thing to be doing. 9% of you are quite happy with how it is. And I love the 8% of you that are going to be attending our RSSL webinars. So thank you for that. So I'd give you a little bit of overview of what we do here at RSSL. Um, we have been providing analytical support to our clients for over 30 years, during which time we've grown and adapted as the industry requirements have changed. In 2019, we were lucky enough to have been shortlisted um, for Business of the Year and Employee of the Year for the Thames Valley Awards. And we actually won the best CRO and enlightened employee in that year. Um, we are based not far from Reading, um, with good links to Heathrow and of course we're MHRA, FDA approved and we have a, a dedicated life science commercial team to help 
guide you to the correct technical support that you may need. We cover a, a broad range of different areas. As you, as you know, I'm the sterile manufacturing lead. So my area is specifically around all those offerings um, within that area, the sterility and mycoplasmid being two of the key ones. But we also have a biopharma division um, that can look after any of your biopharma analytical um, requirements. We have an impurities division that um, specializes in eking out those impurities. And at the moment, the nitrosamines is a big thing there. We have a medical devices division that can help with extractable and leachables or with physical testing of those materials. And then our bread and butter is our, our core work. So this is the pharmaceutical analysis of raw materials across the board uh, in the pharmaceutical industry and as well as uh, finished product batch release testing. But how can RSSL um, help you with Annex 1 support? As I said, I work with the microbiology team. Uh, they're based at our new Wokingham facility, which is about six miles from our main site. And those of you who have attended previous webinars will have seen some of the teams in some of my slides. So we can help with all aspects um, involved in Annex 1, such as the environmental monitoring and risk assessment, which we might be going into a little bit more detail today. And this can include identification of organisms. Um, we have a new moldy top, which can identify those organisms that you have, might have found on your EM plates or in your bio burden cultures. We can help with cleaning validation. Um, this could be with a full cleaning validation assessment with consultants visits or just doing the analysis side of things for you. We can also help with your disinfection validation. Again, um, we can help both um, from a consultative point of view, or we can actually um, do the, the analytical work for you. Annex 1 talks a lot about single-use plastics and a move towards these in the industry. So you may need to know the extractable and leachable profile of your um, plastics. As I mentioned previously, we have a team that's dedicated to this. And our raw our core business that um, test all the raw materials, again, are there to test um, any of raw materials that are going into your uh, manufacturing across the whole industry. Um, especially, this is especially true in the biopharma sector where pharmacopoeia methods generally aren't available and we might need to develop or tweak a method for you. And of course, the microbiology team I work with can do all the, the bio burdens, the endotoxin, the mycoplasma testing of those raw materials. We can also look at your vials and stoppers um, if in your aseptic fill finish sites. And we can help with container integrity testing as well. Particulate control is a key area, and we have a, a large microscopy team that can help identify particulates that you might find in your manufacturing process. Um, of course, we do the sterility, as I've mentioned previously, we've had our sterility facility up and running over a year now. And finally, we can help train your team. We have a training group that are dedicated um, to both running virtual courses, they used to do in-house courses with companies um, and they've also got some online training that they can help with. Any of these, if you're interested, please just contact me. I'd now like to introduce you to Dr. Tim Sandel, who I'm sure many of you have heard of and subscribe to his many different publications. Tim has over 25 years of experience in microbiological research and biopharmaceutical processing. Tim is the member of several editorial boards and he has written over 600 book chapters, peer review paper and technical articles relating to microbiology. Tim works for a pharmaceutical manufacturer in the UK and also finds time to be a visiting tutor at both the University of Manchester and UCL. So I'll now hand you over to Tim. Hey, thank you very much. So just uh, switch slides. Okay, hopefully everyone can see the slides okay. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be um, back um, 
with you. And uh, on that poll, I think I would also be um, hugging family and friends and uh, visiting a pub and restaurant. But of course, I might be listening to a webinar while I'm in the pub or the restaurant. Um, so welcome to this um, presentation. Again, the reason for picking this theme, as Annette um, alluded to, was again linked to the forthcoming changes to Annex 1. And it's very clear in reading the revision of Annex 1 that the term quality risk assessment or quality risk management appears on many occasions. And we know that regulators have expressed concerns about the um, quality of risk assessments and the way that risk assessments are being used. And that includes not using um, risk assessments um, proactively, and there's too, much, too many cases of risk assessments being used um, retrospectively. So there's a number of things that need to be um, strengthened here. Um, so risk assessment can be expressed as a formal process, and it does contain a number of um, key steps, which are on the slide. So this involves um, establishing the context and environment that could present a risk identifying the hazards and considering the risks these hazards present to a product and ultimately to the patient. An analysis of the risks, including uh, an assessment of the various contributing factors, evaluating and prioritizing the risks in terms of the actions required, and identifying the range of options that are available to us in order to tackle these risks, and then also to decide how to implement robust risk mitigation strategies. So to perform this kind of exercise, there are a range of risk methodologies available, probably far too many and, and some quite obscure. So part of what we'll be looking at is some of the more common and useful risk assessment methodologies. And some are gonna be more applicable to a given situation than others. And it's always important to bear in mind that risk assessment doesn't need to be and really shouldn't be a complicated process. And it should be appropriate to the type of sector that we're working in, the particular product or the particular scenario that's presenting itself. So what I'm going to do is run through risk assessment in general, some risk assessment tools, and then in order for it not to be too dry and abstract, is to kind of round up with some examples of applying risk assessment in real life, and, and I've picked environmental monitoring for that purpose. Um, so to begin with, um, what is risk? And often the term risk as any outcome of the risk assessment is confused with the word um, hazard. And what risk is, is an expression of a hazard. And a hazard is the potential source of harm. And a hazard either exists or it doesn't exist. And what the risk assessment does is it assesses the hazard in terms of its likelihood to occur and the severity should it occur. And some hazards are of more concern than others. And just because hazards exist or multiple hazards might exist in one situation doesn't necessarily mean they are a problematic risk. And in fact, many hazards are dormant, only having the potential to cause harm should a particular set of circumstances cause them to um, be something that's bad. Um, so the hazard concept can only really be understood with the probability or likelihood of the, hazard, of the hazard causing harm, and then when it occurs, the degree of severity. And we can divide hazards up in the healthcare and pharmaceutical context as something that could be physical, chemical, biological, even psychological, or ergonomic. So risk is a consequence of hazard occurring, and it's then also clearer to consider risk as a probabilistic concept and something that's inseparable from the factors of probability and uncertainty. So it's just a different way of 
conceptualizing what we mean by risk. So in terms of types of hazards, as I said, we have physical hazards, that's something that could cause direct harm to a person or to damage a piece of equipment. Chemical hazards could cause harm to a person or they could cause product adulteration, so something connected to cleaning validation, for example. Biological hazards are biological agents that could cause harm to the human body or they could adulterate the product. And obviously a clear cut example here are microorganisms and microbial toxin byproducts. Psychological factors can play a role in uh, pharmaceuticals and healthcare, particularly with operator fatigue. And we know that fatigue operators um, can present contamination issues, particularly within aseptic processing, as can ergonomic hazards if we can't adequately reach things and we have to then engage in um, non-aseptic practices. So the hazards that can present risks to pharmaceuticals and healthcare operations are going to be varied. And we need to apply this kind of thinking to things like materials and ingredients, the physical characteristics and composition of the product, the processing procedures that we're following, the microbial controls and microbial limits, uh, clean room design, equipment design, process flows, the cleaning and disinfection regime, the uh, activities of people and steps to minimize um, potential for human error and control of utilities and so on. And in terms of expressing risk, and we often talk about this probabilistic risk that I mentioned earlier, this refers to risk assessment approaches that draw on a often numerical or at least um, qualified expression between severity and probability. And in terms of a numerical expression, when we come to look at failure mode and effect analysis, this is a prime example. So under these circumstances, um, risk is characterized by two quantities, the magnitude or severity of the possible adverse consequences and the likelihood probability of the occurrence of each consequence. And I'm going to keep going back to these, these terms. So the outcome or consequence can be expressed numerically in order to express how severe something can be. And their likelihoods of occurrence can also be expressed as probabilities or frequencies, how likely something to happen. And the total risk is the expected threat, the relationship between this severity and this probability. And we can, if we want to use a numerical score, express that by multiplication. So we can multiply a severity score by a probability score. Now, we also need to consider risk reduction and risk mitigation. And sometimes this can be driven by improvements to training, strong procedures, or the adoption of new technologies. So for example, if we consider aseptic processing, if we look at uh, open wraps on the left hand side of the screen, that presents a theoretically greater risk of microbial and particulate contamination than does the image on the right hand side of the screen, which is a fully closed barrier isolator. So the same risks are there, the same um, potential severity, let's say microorganisms getting into an aseptic product, so the severity is equal for both of those pieces of equipment, but the likelihood that the risk might occur is more likely on the left hand side and less likely on the right hand side. So we can reduce risk through technological improvements. Now, one of the conundrums or quandaries of, of any risk assessment is to what level should or can um, a risk assessment process aim to lower risks? And what is an acceptable level of risk reduction? And sometimes people talk of this ALARA concept or as low as reasonably achievable. And this can be useful to a degree, but we still have to be sure that we're not going to harm a patient. Um, and this approach was first used in the earlier days of, of risk management when it was um, more common in the 
health and safety field um, before becoming adopted by other industries like pharmaceuticals. Um, and some advantages of like thinking in this concept is that the at least the residual risk is known and the basis of acceptance of the residual risk is clearly defined and agreed by all parties. And also we can establish a baseline of what can be achieved versus the effect and we can consider available resources, technical capability, investment requirements and the level of technology. So at least when we're talking about reducing risks, we can verbalize what we mean by, by that. Whether that's acceptable to everybody is a different thing, but at least there's an approach within that. Then to deliver risk, and we've spoken about um, risk tools. If you start searching across the um, internet, you will start to find a myriad of different risk assessment tools. Some are the same, just dressed up in different languages and repackaged by one organisation over another, and some are fundamentally different. Some require complex computer programmes and equations, such as Monte Carlo modelling. Others can be approached on a more simple basis. And they're the ones that I'm going to be concerned with, because again, in most cases, we have a, an issue we want to address, either something before we've done something or after it. And we want to deliver a robust risk assessment, but we want to deliver it relatively quickly. So we have things like uh, fishbone diagrams, um, which are a simple and effective tool to help group discussion and they can help shape cause and effect. And we can draw a lot from flow charts and process mapping. But perhaps the two most um, common tools that we will experience within the pharmaceutical and healthcare context are failure modes and effect analysis. And this is an approach that evaluates every potential failure and then takes the users through a process of risk reduction. So it not only rates the risk, it enables prioritization of the risks. And this works fairly well on items of equipment. And then we have the building up of the flowchart process mapping approach which is through hazard analysis, critical control points, or HACCP. And this approach then enables us to show the flow through the process and then to pinpoint critical control points and establish limits for those control points when we've attempted to reduce the risks. And we're gonna have a look at those in a little bit more detail now. So beginning with failure modes and effect analysis, this is a step-by-step -step approach for identifying all possible failures in a design, a manufacturing or assembly a process or product or a surface. So for example, it could be a ultrafiltration unit. It could be an isolator unit. It could be a new design of vessel. These are the kind of examples where FMEA can prove useful. So we're looking at these things called failure modes. And this is the means, or there are this means, the ways or the modes in which something might fail. So failures are errors or defects. And then we have the effects analysis part, which is looking at the consequences of those failures should they occur. So you see we're looping back again to that same uh, expression of risk. And failures are prioritized to show how serious the consequences are, how frequently they occur, and also the FMEA builds in how easily they can be detected. So it's about guiding us to take actions to eliminate or reduce failures, and we can start with the higher risk ones through a risk ranking process. Then with HACCP, so HACCP originated in the um, food industry in the, in, the, in the early 1960s, but because that's all geared around hygiene improvements, the same philosophy applies to um, a pharmaceutical process. So HACCP is a management system in which safety is addressed through the analysis of biological, chemical and physical hazards. And it can begin with anything like raw material production through to final formulation and distribution of a product 
and it uses a flow chart approach to look for contamination risks, points of risk mitigation and monitoring points. And we'll loop back to HACCP when we look at some of the um, case studies shortly. It's also important to benchmark, benchmark risks and have an understanding of those. So benchmarking is a measure of performance that's using specific indicator and it results in a, a metric that then we can compare one risk with another risk or one risk assessment to another risk assessment or between projects or even between organizations. Um, so the idea of benchmarking is quite useful and this also features in the necessity to re-review risk assessments. So risk assessments should not be things that should sit on a shelf gathering dust, they should be pulled out at every change control that's applicable or reviewed on a regular basis as well. So we can make regular comparisons with um, best practices, uh, it can help to identify gaps, we can explore new ways of improving how things are done, we can then ideally introduce um, improved processes and we have a way of monitoring and measuring progress um, as we work through um, different systems or re-review risks. We also need to consider whether doing a risk assessment is a productive use of time. So it might seem a little strange that we're running this webinar about risk assessments to raise the question of um, are risk assessments beneficial or to phrase it more accurately are all risk assessments beneficial. But it understands that sometimes risk assessments um, are either not necessary or at least they're unnecessarily complex and sometimes having risk assessments that are too complex can lead them to going wrong not seeing the wood for the trees to, to use a cliche um, or it may not justify the time spent on them when the actual thing we're dealing with is relatively obvious and we have to bear in mind that risk assessments can be expensive processes to run especially in terms of time and resources um, so we may need to want to do a you know a risk benefit analysis and we can simply we can simplify the process for example just by running two lists and cross comparing them so there are sometimes more simple tools that can be used for more simple issues and i'm not diminishing the need for risk for serious contamination events but there are other times where we can use more simple risk approaches and risk assessments are also fundamental in terms of Annex 1 and Annex 1 guides us to embed risk assessment into the pharmaceutical quality system. So the pharmaceutical quality system as defined by Annex 1 is a strategy to um, develop and to use effective monitoring and control systems for process improvement and product quality. So it's all about a mechanism to provide assurance of the suitability and capability of our processes and that also links with the aims and expectations of ICH Q10. So the risk assessment, the risk management approach is useful for identifying and monitoring those control systems and it's also a good way to capture organisational knowledge and to use that knowledge appropriately. And we can also connect up the risk and the pharmaceutical quality system with the contamination control strategy, which is going to be the subject of the next webinar in this series. So um, th there's a, a quite a good interconnection with all of that. And it's also notable that Annex 1 says that for anyone tasked in the batch release process, so qualified person and others, have to be fully conversant with all of the risks that the pharmaceutical or healthcare organisation is facing at any particular time and what any gaps are and what any risk mitigation strategies are and whether existing risks are at an acceptable level. So you see everything bounds together in that process. Now a lot of what Annex 1 is talking about in terms of risk assessment uh, uh, comes down from ICH Q9 which sets out 
a wide ranging set of objectives around quality risk management. So, for example, just, just pulling some of those things um, from that, um, you know, it's obvious that the manufacturer must be producing products that are fit for their intended use and not placing patients at risk. So we need to understand what we mean by the, the patient risk. Um, there's also built into that that senior management must have a system in place for conducting risk assessments that are geared around product quality and safety and that resources are there to enable those risk assessments to take place and that the risk management system must be bound up with the quality assurance system and be a fundamental part of good manufacturing practice. That risk should be fully documented and their effectiveness continuing to be monitored as part of the life cycle approach. And those undertaking risk assessments must be the appropriate subject matter experts and um, understanding what they are addressing. So in terms of the kind of the two fundamentals that come out from the ICHQ9 expectations as I see them, is that we need to use a scientific approach to risk assessment on the understanding that we know what we are um, talking about. So for example, um, I'm a microbiologist, um, so if we were undertaking a risk assessment that might say extend a product hold time, then if that didn't involve a microbiologist, that would be a concern because extended hold times provide the opportunity for increased microbial growth. So you need to have that knowledge going into the process. And also risk assessment can help us to build the, with, with new products, a targeted product profile, and we can help us to identify critical quality attributes that we want to take forward. And that kind of fits in with the detection and monitoring um, process. Now, quality risk management is frequently the subject to GMP, inspectorate deficiencies. And this is either due to not doing them or not doing them correctly or using them inappropriately. So some examples I've just pulled out from um, searching uh, GMP deficiencies are failure to embed a risk assessment within GM within recall procedures, um, not using risk assessment for change controls, um, risk assessments being inadequate by not assessing all of the hazards in relation to cross-contamination, um, or risk assessments um, being inappropriate, like concluding low risk. And one of the dangers to get across and one of the challenges with um, inspections is not to sort of get in a room and say, right, how do we come up, how do we make this a low risk? Because that can be perfectly um, obvious. And one thing that inspectors are very critical of are the so-called SATNAV risk assessments, where you're deliberately trying to guide to a particular outcome the risk assessment should be unbiased and the outcome is the outcome and then you attempt to mitigate those risks. And then specifically with um, the revisions to Annex 1, there is an expectation that quality risk management is used to review existing products and processes. It's used to help the development of new products and processes to fit in with quality by design and also to address problems and procedures that arise in terms of helping um, to shape uh, deviation management. So although regulatory authorities are encouraging risk assessment, this is with the expectation that the majority of risk assessments are proactive. So you're looking at things in advance, you know, like we're about to buy a new piece of equipment or we're about to make a change to the process. What do we need to think about? And one of the criticisms is, is that there are too many reactive risk assessments, which could be interpreted as attempts to risk assess your way out of trouble, which is not really an appropriate use of risk assessment. Now, those kind of things are sometimes going to occur. But the more proactive risk assessments have been done, then the fewer reactive risk assessments that should arise. 
Plus there is this concern about prejudging outcomes, which I've mentioned. And there are some areas as well where those three aspects of risk assessment don't necessarily always work. So severity is important and likelihood is important, but we do need to be careful with detection. So if we're going to take something like environmental monitoring, where we're taking small sample sizes using methods that at best can only give us 50% recovery, and that 50% recovery is only of culturable microorganisms, and bear in mind that a number are non-culturable, to approach anything and just say, oh, well, we've got a few plates out, everything's okay, is often going to be less acceptable given the limitations of environmental monitoring as a foolproof detection tool. Um, other points to draw out is again, looping back to ICHQ9, is that um, there's mention there of risk management being a systematic process. And it includes in that not only the assessment, but the building of the necessary controls, but also things like communication. So there's no value in doing a risk assessment, uh, say within quality assurance, and producing a nice document and, and putting it into the filing system if those who will be impacted by that are unaware of the outcome. And then again, we have the issues of regular review and embedding those requirements into the change control process. So as I said before, a good risk assessment is one that uses sound science as part of the decision making. And it should be systematic and have a structured process, perhaps not too rigid a structure that this could lead to key concepts being overlooked, but there needs to be an approach that can be followed with a degree of logic. The risk assessment should also be transparent, so it should be easy to look back and understand what was looked at and what was covered. So even things that might be excluded it's good to list those as we haven't looked at these elements because they are not deemed to be significant, but at least it's up front. They also need to be inclusive. So um, again, going back to that example, um, if we're doing a risk assessment into a production process, if it was to be quality assurance and R&D meeting to do the risk assessment and not involving production, that would not be inclusive regularly reviewed and fitting into changes and any continuous improvement ideas. Um, and risk assessment is part of risk management and risk management is a broader umbrella term and that, that describes the identification, the need to do a risk assessment as well as the assessment and as well as the prioritization of risk. So if we as an organization have 40 risks that we've identified in what order are we going to approach those and it would be again um, generally logical to deal with the high risks first and also risk management needs to assess whether time and resources are available and also the process of mitigating a risk versus the um, degree of inaction that might stem from not immediately mitigating that risk. So the risk management should ensure there are, is a clear purpose and a meaningful outcome to the risk assessment process. And it's probably a good idea to have a board in place to e evaluate that. Um, so risk management is this process of identifying risk, assessing risk, and taking steps to reduce risk to an acceptable level. And risk management also needs to define the, the processes, which techniques and tools are we going to be using? What are going to be the team roles and responsibilities and how will they change for different projects? So a risk management plan would describe how the risk management process is structured and then how the risk assessments are executed. So again, it's ideal there's somebody with that responsibility and there's a cross-functional group who are going to be regularly 
reviewing that. So they can identify risks, check on the assessments of the risks, evaluate significance, look at how responses are going to be handled. We have a reporting structure. We're ensuring that we're communicating and then driving any changes to procedures or setting corrective and preventative actions. And then even to allow for an independent um, oversight. And some may flag the concern of whether, you know, we actually know where the risks are. So how do we identify risks and how do we know whether any new risks have appeared? So there are some things that might constitute good practice that we need to draw on. So we can observe staff behaviours, we can trend deviations, we can trend cappers, we can ensure the degree that we have a quality culture. We can have management walk in the floor on a regular basis. We can draw data from internal audits or local ownerships. We can ensure we have experts reviewing data and trends. And we have KPIs that are not just there about, say, maximizing profit on a product, but are also there to assess the quality of the product. So we can do things like develop risk registers, as shown on the um, screen there is just an example of risk ranking um, a series of different risks um, and it allows us to, to work through uh, that process and then we have um, issues of um, developing appropriate uh, plans and then also about aligning uh, things to appropriate um, budget and resources and also setting realistic timelines. So here's another example of um, risk prioritization. This is quite a simple four-way matrix, but it's a way of saying, you know, we've got 40 or 50 risks in the organization. So we can group some of them as, as into high severity, high likelihood, and some into low severity, low likelihood in other places. And at least this shows to an auditor or inspector or to our internal management, that we are dealing with our risks in an appropriate order and we have some kind of game plan in place. Okay, so that's lots of theory, a bit of philosophy, a bit of practice, a bit on the tools and that's all very good, but how do we actually use risk assessments in practice? So I'm gonna focus on environmental um, monitoring and just in the final part of the webinar, just have a look at some examples of that. Um, so with environmental monitoring, we need to consider what the hazards are. And a lot of that is gonna be what we might class as intrinsic, extrinsic hazards. So these are entities that are not integral characteristic of the product or the process. So for uh, the the intrinsic issues would have issues with buyer burden control within the intermediate manufacturing. But for this perspective, what we're looking at here, we're looking at extrinsic contamination. So this could be the uh, microorganisms present on people or say microorganisms in the general clean room environment or uh, in relation to any water, any cleaning processes. And this, considering these hazards looks at the risk of ingress, the risk of accessing, the risk of actually contaminating, and the risk of actually being retained into the product. And we can work through that as primary sources to secondary sources and ending up in the product. And this can help us to structure the risk assessment. Um, so we could like apply this in say in the context of um, aseptic filling, for example. And generally, we have these, these kind of two main concerns about um, direct surface to surface transfer, such as uh, personnel directly touching a product component, or with airborne transfer, say with poor airflow, as an example. Um, so that's one area we can begin to think about. Another area would be to um, look at the environmental monitoring program and to use risk assessment to assess how often we might be monitoring for. Um, so if we've got a large facility, we've got a C and C area, we've got grade D, grade C, how often should these be done? 
the guidance is strong in Annex 1 about aseptic processing in Grade B, continuous uh, in Grade A, but other areas we may want to weigh up a number of factors. So we might look at these factors and weight them differently. So we might want to give a higher weighting if there's a more dirty activity being performed in an adjacent room. We'd want to assess um, during that activity there's no transfer to the cleaner area. Um, we might want to focus on routes of transfer, incoming goods, areas of component preparation. We want to factor in duration of activity. Um, we might want to give higher frequencies to ambient areas as opposed to cold rooms. We may want to give more weighting to areas where we're using water sources compared to areas without water sources or where we have product opening. Or we may want to follow the process cascade and increase our weighting as we move downstream through purification to final formulation. So there's, there's no right or wrong approach, but we can introduce a degree of risks thinking to environmental monitoring. Now, I mentioned HACCP earlier. So remember, that's the hazard analysis critical control points. And this can be very useful, for, particularly for helping to pinpoint environmental monitoring locations. So it helps us to identify hazards, which are the contamination risks, including their various sources, so air services, people, for example, and then the routes that they might track through the process. And this can help us pinpoint things like um, we might be concerned um, at areas adjacent to clean rooms. We might be concerned about uh, interfaces between clean rooms of different grades, so this leads to airlocks, for example. We might be concerned where we have um, less than ideal um, airflow within a room. We may have certain surfaces that present themselves as hard to clean that are close to where product is handled. We may want to focus about where more people congregate within the room. We might be concerned about particulate generation when a CIP unit is run. So there are various factors um, and often we're focusing quite a lot on human activity, um, entry and exit routes and also the way that materials are transferred into clean rooms of different grades, so like pass-through boxes and proximity to the product. But again these are just generalized examples of how we need to introduce risk-based thinking into sample selection. And to do this, we need to have a thorough understanding of the process. Uh, we can't do this in isolation and, and, and micro, microbiologists can't do this by themselves because they would need to work with those who have knowledge of the manufacturing process and the methods of producing and formulating product of what the different manufacturing stages mean and what um, microbial reduction steps there are in that process. So I'll be using, uh, for example, affinity chromatography, where we might have a different charge effect to remove microorganisms, or where are we using sterile materials, where are we using single-use technology, and so on. Um, so there are a whole range of factors that we need to consider. And the HACCP risk model guides us in this process because it enables us to assess risk it enables us to determine the monitoring points, which we can call critical control points in the, in the HACCP lexicon, to help us establish critical limits, to establish um, a system to monitor and control these critical points. It can help us guide to appropriate corrective actions when we find that something is not under control. It allows us to establish procedures to confirm and verify that things are working. We can build in documentation of re, uh, and reporting and we also have a tool to help train and educate staff and we'll end up with data to collect and there are various um, HACCP flowcharts and decision trees available and there's just one example on there but you can find those quite um, readily so we have a formalized structure that isn't too deterministic and we end up with this appropriate tool that we can train people against. 
and a series of questions can help guide our thinking. So we can sort of ask ourselves as we go through this flow, what areas, what, what would be a environmental monitoring location that is close proximity to the processing activity? What sites or equipment are contacted by personnel? Where do people interact? Which sites might represent the most difficult areas to clean and disinfect? Where is the greatest amount of activity? What are the routes of flow? What are the routes of entry points? And then we can superlay that with the different vectors of contamination that could occur relating to air supply, room air, surfaces, people, machines, and equipment. And we can assess the importance of each one of those as part of a decision basis to weigh up whether they are genuine hazards and whether they need to be controlled or not, and also assess the likely level of contamination and as well as its potential transfer, as well as the ease of dispersal. And often that requires an understanding of proximity of that as well. And also what methods we have in, in to control or what methods can we add. So we need to look at the quality of HEPA filters. We need to look at segregation of equipment. We need to look at which areas might be considered to be dirty, such as equipment cleaning, relative to where we are processing, um, to the types and design of surfaces, the surface materials, the gowning of people and how well they are trained. So a whole myriad of factors we can come in and then we can also then decide what is the most valid sample to take. Is it a swab? Is it a contact plate? Is it a settle plate? Is it an active air sample? Is it a sample of personnel? Or even introducing a rapid microbiological method. And what kind of alert levels do we want to be responding to? And in general rule is the greater the hazard, the, more, the less control and assurance we have around that, then the greater the level of monitoring we're likely to do. Or if we see issues with trending, then we may want to feed that back in as well. And with any establishment of this kind of HACCP, it's important to periodically verify that to ensure that the control system is working effectively. So this involves reviewing key targets like rejection rates, sample results, control methods, and so on. So a robust way of reviewing data is also important and when we for those of you who were here for the environmental monitoring session last year we put a great deal of emphasis upon trending and that the environmental monitoring without trending is is very weak okay so bringing the uh, presentation to, to an end in the, in the time that we have um, we have set out to provide an overview of, of hazards and then the risk assessment process and also what is involved in a good risk management system. And we looked at some of the general requirements, pitfalls and challenges, and some of the things that regulators are keen on and examples of good and bad practices. And we looked at examples of environmental monitoring to show that. And you know, the key message is that risk assessment needs to be, needs to have a purpose needs to have a multidisciplinary team, it needs to follow some kind of logical process, and it needs to be communicated, reviewed, and any gaps acted upon. So thank you very much, and we can move over to the uh, Q&A and hand back to Annette. Thank you, Tim. That, that was... Um really useful. I'm sure many people will have some questions. We've had one or two come through while you've been talking. Um, so people have asked, um, what do regulators think of risk assessments generally? Um, that's a, diff a tricky one. Um, risk assessment should be, I mean, the, the, the ICH guidelines came out many years ago and I think then regulators have said that they're good for some things, but they're not necessarily um, being done um, as well or correctly as they should be. So um, a good risk assessment is a good risk assessment, but I think the, the, the guidance is that most should be proactive. 
most should be open-minded most should have at least two versions so you do it first you come up with um, a number of risks you go away set tasks to mitigate those risks and then you come back and do your next version to show those have gone and that the reactive risk assessment should only be for really free emergencies not trying to risk a way out of out of trouble so I think it's good in theory but regulators have picked up a lot of examples of, of poor risk assessments okay um i've got a question from ezra um she says for high severity high detectability low probability the risk will be low are there any special considerations to be taken in this case as it's still a high severity um i think it depends on the um context i mean if you're saying like aseptic filling when there's no um final sterilization step, a microorganism getting in is always going to be something of high severity because it could cause patient harm. But if you've got good controls in place, you've got adequate cleaning and disinfection, sanitization, um, barrier systems, well-trained staff, and obviously that likelihood drops off. And then you're boosting that with um, a well thought out environmental monitoring program. That would be an example. So there's probably no more um, you can do but if it was something like uh, you might be storing gas cylinders near the works canteen that would be high severity if they blew up but um, you might have loads of controls in place and you may have good detection alarm systems if you get a leakage but why not just move those away from the canteen anyway so just trying to, it's two different examples so it's always a yes or no answer <laughs> all right excellent um, Adams asked, in order to be proactive in risk assessment, is the CCS key to this? Um, I think so, certainly from the um, specific microbial chemical and particulate contamination. I think they go hand in hand because, and I think the, the, the contamination control strategy would be um, essential in the risk identification because um, that allows you to take a thorough look at everything, look at areas where you might be weaker, and then you can feed that into the risk assessment process, carry out the risk assessments, reduce those risks down, and then go back to the contamination control strategy, and then you can uh, complete a, a gap within that. So I think they're interconnected the same way that risks are also interconnected to the pharmaceutical quality system. Okay, thank you. Uh, sadly, we, we've run out of time. Um, so thank you for answering the questions, Tim. Um, we'll put a few more to you to get answers back. As I said, we'll send out the questions and the answers along with the slides and um, a link to the recording for people who attended. Um, thank you all for listening. I hope you found it useful. If um, Please remember that we've got a webinar running every month um, this year, and our next webinar is on the 26th of May. And that's going to be covering, as, as Tim alluded to, the uh, elements of contamination control strategy. So on behalf of RSSL and the sterile manufacturing team here, I'd like to thank Tim for continuing to deliver such informative webinars for us, and for everybody out there for listening. Please do not hesitate to contact me if you have any questions or if you would like to know more about any services that we can support you with. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in May. Thank you. Thank you.